by and large, if you're out playing in the clubs mm. and the word is out that you're good, either someone's going to come and tell one of us here or you're going to oh. send something to us, some kind of press kit. Mm-hmm. And we like to look at all that kind of stuff. So please send it all out. We're all here. And we love listening. We love finding new stuff. And and persistence is great. You know, sometimes people go, ah, I don't want to bother them. And I, Stop. Don't even worry about that. Bother us. Bother the crap out of us. <laughs> and eventually someone's going to pick up on it, you know? I mean, look at it this way. For us, from the buyer side, mm-hmm. you don't think we badger these major artists for for acts all the time? I mean, no, we call ways. them till they get sick of hearing from us, right? <laughs> sure. And then finally they may turn around and say, just sell them a damn band. We're sick of listening right. to them, you know? <laughs> and and that's, how we, that's kind of how we all started in the business. We have no problem if there's passion, mm. right? Yeah. If, if it's... If somebody's going to badge us and then say, oh, the money's not right, don't do that. But if right. if you want to come to us and you have a passion for playing, yes, you'll get in. It, might, it may take a little bit, but you'll get in. What's going on? Welcome to the new music business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book, third edition, coming out soon. Look out for for that. Today, my guest is Bob Babish. He has been running Summerfest, the world's largest music festival in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, for the last 46, count them, 46 years. He is the top dog, and we had a, an interesting conversation. Summerfest has a special place in my heart, as you'll hear as I, I tell Bob the story. I used to book a stage there, run a couple stages. I met so many agents and artists by booking stages between 2006 and 2010, and of course, performing on these stages, a, a big part of my background in history as an artist coming up in Wisconsin and in the Midwest was from Summerfest. I a huge part of my fan base and my audience discovered me at Summerfest. I mean, I was playing multiple times a day on multiple stages there. I kind of DIY'd my way into the festival, as as you'll hear a little bit. I was playing these kind of pop-up side stages and, and running that. But Summerfest has hundreds and hundreds of artists that play every year. We're talking this year alone. It's the who's who of music. You know, we have artists like Jason Aldean and Justin Bieber and Lil Wayne and Jaden and Willow Smith and Wu-Tang Clang and Wiz Khalifa. A disturbed Avril Lavigne, Machine Gun Kelly, Backstreet Boys, Cheap Trick, The Black Crows, Steve Miller Band, Jason Aldean, Death Cab for Cutie, Charlie XCX, Modest Mouse, Anthony Hamilton, Third Eye. I mean, Steve Aoki. I could keep going. I'm just literally just scrolling down and reading the, the names that are in front of me. Two Chains. It's it's nuts. Alessia Cara, I'm Portugal the Man. It, honestly, there's music for everyone of every generation. Oh my gosh, Boys to Men, Taking Back Sunday, Bare Naked Ladies. Every generation, every demographic, every genre. It's a nine day festival in Milwaukee. It, and there are local bands too. And that we actually spend quite a bit of time talking about the uh, local, regional, and emerging artists and how they get to play the festival too. As an artist myself, you know, I would always play kind of in the early evening, late afternoon, and I would be the artist that people would discover as they're just walking around the festival grounds trying to, you know, there for the headliners at 8 or 10 o'clock that night and who are just, just walking around just there to discover music. And that's one of the most exciting parts about any festival, but especially Summerfest. And of all the festivals, Festivals around the country. This is one of the more unique festivals because of just how it's laid out. And we talk all about that with Bob. So if you're interested in the festival market, we get into the nitty gritty of how it all runs from hospitality to staging and sound and lights and and who runs the front of house and monitors and, and stage hands and where all that comes from, how the hospitality works and how you get booked and who's doing the booking and how to go about booking this, whether you're an artist or a manager or an agent or or anyone that wants to get their act booked at Summerfest and when to start hitting them up. Hint, hint, now. (laughs) As always, please like, subscribe, follow this podcast, however you're listening to this. If you could just pause this and and just hit that subscribe button, that would be awesome, really help us out. Please leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. I love reading those reviews and it really, really helps. So if you're listening on Spotify, hit that five-star review button or if you're listening on Apple or however you're listening to this, if you're listening on YouTube, leave me a comment. I'd love to to read the comments as well. You can find us all that make this show happen at Instagram and Twitter and TikTok at Ari's Take. You can find 
find me at Ari Herstand on Instagram and Twitter. And head over to Ari'sTake.com. Get on that email list. That's the most important part of everything that you can do that because that's where we send out all the most up-to-date information about the new music business, everything that's happening. Get on that email list. Head over to Ari'sTake.com. Get on that. All right, let's kick into the show. Welcome to the show. How you doing, Ari? Great. So, all right, I have to start off. This is, I have to start off on a personal note. I want to, first off, thank you for your 42 years. I believe that's what it's been that you have, you have been, is, is it 42? 46. Oh my gosh. 46, 46 years that you've been part of, you've been doing the Summerfest thing, man. Yeah. Summerfest, you know, I grew up in Wisconsin and- Get uh, out of here. Really? Where? Oh, what I grew up in uh, Shorewood near Milwaukee. I oh, went to- Okay, there right, you go right down the road, elementary school there. And then Madison, I went to middle and high school. And so Summerfest was just like the holy grail of live music. And, you know, it gave me a place growing up to always go and see music. And when I, you know, little 14 year old Ari, one of the only places that under, you know, people under 21, under 18 could go see great music. And it honestly was one of the things that kind of set me on the path of music was going to Summerfest and getting to just like feel that energy and see some of these incredible artists. And, you know, and then Fast forward, I don't know if you remember this, but I've played Summerfest many times and uh, helped book the Chipotle stage and the Chevy stage and was like running stages. And so like Summerfest has had a, a long, long place and a, and a deep place in my heart. Well, good. I mean, it's always, that's what makes the event kind of cool, you know, for especially people Southeastern Wisconsin. From when we, the yeah. day we started it, we wanted to hit as many genres of music as we could every day, keep yep. the price down and just get people to come out and have a party. You know, so you can always come down here and see four different, four or five different genres of music in one afternoon and one evening and yeah. walk around and see what you like and what you don't like. And you might experience something new. And it was a cool vibe for people that used to come. I don't know how old you are, but probably like in, in the 80s. And, and, yeah. and it's, it, it was it was a cool vibe because people would just come just to hang out. They'd start mm. like outside of the Miller stage and they'd all congregate there and go, well, let's just go hang out and see what's happening at the other stages and, and wander yeah. around. And, and that was the charm of the event. So for people who don't know about Summerfest, who haven't been, just kind of break it down, you know, what is, just explain Summerfest, because it's it's such a, a unique festival in the way that it's laid out. I mean, I always kind of compare it, it's kind of like uh, the state fair meets uh, Lollapalooza or something like that, but it's much, much, much bigger. I mean, there's a reason that it's called the world's largest music festival, but just kind of break it down from the top level. What is Summerfest for people? Sure, and I'll know. give you a little history. So it, it yes, please. It started out, there was a mayor in, in Milwaukee at the time, Henry Meyer, and they were having some racial issues in town. Mm -hmm. And he went over to Germany and he was at the Oktoberfest. And he said, well, this is a cool thing. All these people getting together, they have a party in the summer. Why can't we do this for our population in Milwaukee? So he yeah. came back and got some of the movers and shakers in the city, some, some money people, the breweries, to kick in some money. And they started doing it the first year or two around different city parks. And it was mm -hmm. really just ethnic dance companies, polka bands, things like that when it started out. <laughs> sure. And they said, we need a spot where we can all congregate together instead of all being in the city parks. And mm. this land down here in downtown Milwaukee was an ex-Nike missile base that was here. And they had oh, wow. fighter planes here. And they decided that space is empty now. Let's use this and create something down there. So they yep. brought the whole thing down to the, what is now the Summerfest grounds. And mm. they put six or seven stages on the grounds and they still stayed in the day in the ethnic dance music for a year or two but gradually it changed over into the rock and pop world and then mm -hmm. it was let's keep it a festival for everybody so yep. you could walk down here even in those days and there was a country stage and there was a classic rock stage and there was a hard rock stage and an r&b stage and you they did all that and then mm -hmm. they had what was called the main stage which at that time was on the north end of the grounds <clears throat> and gradually the acts that were playing that main stage became bigger acts in the business in the country, and they started bringing out bigger production, bigger sound and light systems and everything, and it didn't work in that venue. So we mm. created the first amphitheater, which was on the south end of the grounds, and we've mm. continued to expand it and create new venues every couple of years, and then we'd remodel the ones we already had. So right now you have like 10 permanent stages on the Summerfest grounds running you know, 80, 90 acres of land. And it's a wonderful event. It's good for the people of Milwaukee and southeastern Wisconsin and in the United States. 
Absolutely. And so of those 10 stages, how many does each stage, how many people does each stage hold about? Uh, sure. For, yeah. You've got, you've got the American Family Insurance Amphitheater, which is brand new. We spent $50 million completely rebuilding this amphitheater so you can mm. put stadium-sized shows in this building. That mm -hmm. holds 24,000 people. Wow. Okay. Then you have the Miller stage, which holds 14,000. And then it gradually goes down all the different stages to like 12,000, 11,000, 8,000, 6,000, 5,000, and runs the gamut. The smaller little, little, small little pop-up stages all over the grounds for grounds entertainers. Cool. Yeah, I mean that's that's the thing that I think that sets Summerfest apart is that all of these stages. I mean, those ten plus the amphitheater plus all the smaller stages, the ground stages, they're all running simultaneously. And so you have music. I mean, you could have ten, twelve, fifteen artists, bands playing all in the same grounds, all at the same time. Which you know, I've been to all the you know festivals around the world, like uh, you know Bonnaroo and Coachella and all of that, but nowhere has that experience where there's that much music. And like you said, if you're not really feeling an act, you could just kind of walk down a few yards and, and there's another act and uh, that you'll probably find something you dig because uh, it really runs the gamut of uh, genres and demographics. I mean, I was just looking at the lineup this year and I mean, it's not even like even just to go down and, and just mention some of these. I mean, you have everyone from like Justin Bieber, of course, you know, Wu-Tang Clan, Wiz Khalifa, Avril Lavigne, yeah. Machine Gun Kelly, and everyone in between, John Fogarty, Black Crows, it's just like on and on and 800 other artists. Right. And for and there are some hard ticket shows like the amphitheater shows, but still right. everything else on the grounds, it's 25 bucks to get in. And there's still a way to get in free every single day. So you're seeing you're seeing the Black Crows, or you're seeing Fogarty, or you're seeing Steve mm -hmm. Miller, or any of those yep. for free, basically, if you want right. to come down and find a way to get in free every single day. And the music starts at noon every day on all the stages and goes till 1130, quarter to 12 every night. So it's a party. And, you know, it's, <laughs> you can put 80, 90,000 people in here and have a hell of a day. Each day, yeah. So tell me about kind of the structure of how the uh, music is laid out in terms of, you know, what kind of acts are you placing at different times during the days on which stages and how and sure. the philosophy um, that goes into that. So it's myself, a gentleman named Scott Zeal, Vic mm -hmm. Thomas, Whit Lamberg, Sean McDonough, and and David Silba. And we're all mm -hmm. together. We're the, we're the booking people for the event, if you will. And we are all looking for talent from all the different agencies around the country or from people that send us things all the time. And every mm -hmm. two days, we sit down and we have a big board up on the computer screen and we have all the stages laid out and we start this process, this little chess game, if you will, on trying to make sure we can hit every single genre every single day as a headliner on the grounds that's going to go on anytime after nine o'clock. So you have mm -hmm. national headline, <clears throat> excuse me, national headliners on every stage, every single night, including mm -hmm. the amphitheater. Mm -hmm. And then in the last few years, we started adding national acts in the afternoon. So mm -hmm. you can come down at, at three o'clock in the afternoon, you can start seeing national acts for the rest of the day. So, cool. and we try to, like I say, hit every genre. Sometimes we miss it, but we try to hit everyone every single chance. So then if you if you have a country act on one stage and all of a sudden there's a country act that you want that you find out three weeks later, now you got to try to move something off another. You got to move the country acts around so you can have only one country act that day. So it's kind of fun. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned the national acts. So that makes me think, and I, I know this firsthand, you do showcase a lot of local acts and talk, talk about that and, and how you decide which, you know, local acts, local Wisconsin acts are going to be, going to be booked. Well, there's, there's a lot of great bands that play in Milwaukee and the regions around us. And, and it changes all the time. I mean, you had bands that came out of Milwaukee, like the Femmes and like the Bodines and, and bands like that. Mm -hmm. Actually, Steve Miller came out of here also. Oh, yeah. And, right. and you try to use the best quality acts that are coming up, and mm -hmm. you try to give some kids a chance. So mm -hmm. we, do, we do a thing every year with uh, Reverb Nation. We do a promotion with them every year where there's electronic press kits that they send out. And we mm -hmm. do 20 or 30 of those acts every year. Mm -hmm. on the grounds usually a little earlier in the day right mm -hmm, we, mm -hmm. but we also do some ex some searching trying to find uh, new acts from around the country that we can put in an afternoon series that we do and we try to pick those cool. bands up also so we're trying to put as many of the good local and regional bands as we can in this venue because you know it's a nine-day event you've got what 11 stages 
you need a lot of inventory to fill it up and you want to put quality bands in and you want to give the kids in Milwaukee or the younger guys in Milwaukee a chance to be mm -hmm. seen. And that, mm -hmm. that's really exciting for all of us. You know, we'll, we'll be all on the ground somewhere doing different things. And one of us will get a call saying, you got to see these guys. These guys are really good. They, these girls are really good. You got to pop over here and we'll cool. go over and see it. And then the cool thing about that is you can, you can walk into an area sometimes and, and there's a band that nobody really knows mm -hmm. and they're starting to play and there's maybe, you know, the area might hold a thousand people and there's maybe 40 or 50 people in there, but then you watch them get on their phones and call some more people who we'll call some more people who we'll call some more people. And all of a sudden this band's got six, 700 people in front of them watching the show. And that's yep. pretty cool. You know? That was always, that was always the trick for me when I was um, booking and playing the Chipotle stage, I would always book myself at 7 PM because I'm like, <laughs> that's the money spot because like people are there early for like the eight o'clock. Those are the kind of the, you know, the, the second tier headliners. And then of course the headliners at 10, but they usually get there around five or six to walk around and just like see and leave themselves open. So I'm like, right. all right, I'm going to play right at seven o'clock. And then people, and that would always happen that way where I would just like attract the people as my favorite thing to do as they're walking around. I'm just like, all right, come on in. And so no matter how many people start were there when I started by the end, the place was totally full and always sold a ton of merch and made a ton of new fans. And that's like why, I mean, one of the main reasons Wisconsin was my biggest market. You know, and that, and that's always been a, a cool thing for bands coming up, even bands that are, you know, are in the first record deal. You yeah. can go out and you can you can play a club and do you know three hundred people, or you can come mm -hmm. over here and play at four o'clock in the afternoon and get two or three thousand people. Exactly. You know, and, and if you got a, if you've got the if the record is good and you got radio behind you, especially you can come mm -hmm. in here and you can have some serious fun and get some, get sell some merch. And next yeah. time around, you know, a smart manager makes sure you don't play here year after year. Yep. You play here for one year, then you go out and do a hard ticket show somewhere else in town. And you come back again and you gradually build your audience up, right? So how, how much of that, the history in the area or the social media presence or kind of, you know, what's happening on streaming or what's happening <clears throat> on radio or, or any of that goes into the decision making of if you're going to book them and, how, you know, where you're going to place them throughout the day? You know, well, we're always we're always watching, you know, the Spotify playlist and see what's going on with that. See what's mm -hmm. coming up new. We're talking to everybody. I mean, we okay. talk to the club owners here. We talk to, to Live Nation guys, the AEG guys, what they're hearing, what they're seeing about a specific act. And we try to we try to try to give people some quality t entertainment earlier in the day now. Like I was saying earlier, you get yep. people to come down and spot, you know, walk into that, see that, go to the next stage and see that. And then we want to make sure that if that, if there's a crowd there, now mm -hmm. we want to talk about that two years ago to build that audience and get them to play a better slot. I mean, mm -hmm. I'll go back to talking about, a, I'll talk about a comedian actually, if the, real quick a guy named sure. Louis Black, who Louis Black got his first, first date out of New York city here. <laughs> right. Wow. He came out of college and he was a playwright in New York and he came and he, he played the comedy stage at three o'clock in the afternoon. And he'll tell you, he was not that good. Right. <laughs> but we saw a spark there. And when he came back again, he was at like four o'clock and then he was at like six o'clock. And then all of a sudden he was a headliner and all of a mm -hmm. sudden he was a headliner for two days. And he came back and he was one of those rare instances where he came back year after year after year. Yep. And even though when he was in the upper echelons of the comedy world and playing, playing for a lot more money than he could make down by us, which I probably shouldn't say, but he would always come back and play for us because he remembered he got his start here. And yep. that was magic. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, that's incredible. For the agents and the artists and the managers who are listening right now who are <laughs> interested in playing Summerfest, first off, when do you start booking the following year and what do you like to see in kind of that pitch? Well, you know, it's interesting in that COVID threw everything out of whack, sure. right? So we had we, we had a, a festival set up for 2020 in the summer. We had to cancel that, took it down, mm -hmm. set it up for fall of 2020, took that down, set it up for 2021, took that down. And put it on again finally in fall of 2021. Yeah. And then now we roll right into summer of 2022, right? So right. It, this summer, the whole world wants to work. The whole world is kind of touring. So yep. everybody's talking now about 23 already. Oh, okay. uh, and if you look at amphitheater shows for the nine days for next year, we probably have seven offers already out there on the nine days for 2023. 
right? Because people are talking now sure. about when are we going to, what are we going to do with 2023? So that the process mm-hmm. is starting earlier and earlier this year. As mm-hmm. far as, as far as agents and, and managers go, I know a lot of the, the established agencies know of us and we, yep. and we do a lot of business, of course, with those guys. But if people have something new, find, let us know where they're going to play in the market, when they're going to play in the market, where mm-hmm. we can see what the magic is that that artist is creating and bringing out. Cool. So we can have a chance to look at it and see if we think that that fits what we're going to do in 23. 2022 is done now. So we're talking right. now about 2023. And once again, with nine days and all those stages and all those time slots starting at mm-hmm. noon, we need a lot of inventory and we need a lot of quality musicians. And I would, would, wouldn't be surprised if everybody's talking 2023 already. And we're we're over a year away now. Is that is that how it has typically gone in years past, or is it because COVID kind of threw everything off? We're now you know a year yeah. away still talking. I, it's definitely because because of the COVID situation because people didn't work sure. for so long, and now right. everybody wants to work. and And the cycle that, that's usually you you make product and then you go out and you tour, then you go back and do some writing and you make product and you go out and tour. I mm-hmm. think that's kind of all thrown out of whack right now, mm-hmm. and. Everybody wants to work. So everybody's talking. If they couldn't play markets or couldn't play events in 22, well, they certainly want to play in 23. For us, <clears throat> excuse me, for us, our main competition yep. is Europe mm-hmm. because our festival starts the same time Glastonbury is happening, right? Okay. So if you're going to play European festivals and you're an artist in the States or even in Europe, you're going to start right around the time that we're starting and you're going to stay there. You're mm-hmm. not going to come back during our window, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of times we're looking now on who's playing all the festivals in 2022. So we can go to them already and say, are you going to stay in the States in 23? Because we want you. And there's a, I'm sure there's a few other events. We talked to a run of Canada festivals that are mm-hmm. going to be looking to right around our same time also that mm-hmm. are going to be looking in 2023 and what stuff is out there. And is it you have about 800 acts that are booked each year? Is that right? Yeah, I think we have a we, couple less days than we used to. We used to be an 11-day okay. festival. Then we were a 10-day festival. Now we're doing a three-weekend, mm-hmm. nine-day event. So it starts on the 23rd of June, and it's Thursday through Saturday, Thursday through Saturday, Thursday through Saturday for three weekends straight. So the number might be down a little bit, probably five or 600, though, when you get right mm-hmm. down to it, play, playing the event. So gotcha. um, it's an exciting time. As you know, you were yeah. here. Yeah. You yeah, remember yeah, yeah. It, it's, what, when's the last time you were here, by the way? Oh, man, it was 2010. I got to get back. It's, yeah, I think uh, it's so. definitely time. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I have so many friends that play it every year, and I always like look at the dates, and I'm, I'm always I'm always on the website every year. It's like, hmm, maybe I, maybe this will be the year that I, I come back. But, you know, my parents are still in Madison, and they go every year, of course. And That's good news. Um, there so, you go. Yeah, definitely. It's it's easy to get back. So wh- what was the when did you move to the uh, the three weekend thing? Is that is that new this year? Last fall was the first try at it. You know, you, you, you fish where the fish are, isn't that what they always say? And people really <laughs> sure. don't want to go out on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Yeah. I mean, they're thinking, they're thinking weekends, save their money to go out on the weekends, stay out a little later, have a little fun. So that Thursday, Friday, Saturday window for us, it, it, we feel it's going to work better than it has in the past. I mean, it's greed, from a greed side for, from the entertainment side. Now, yeah. instead of having 10 straight days, now we have three full weekends, so we have like a 21-day window where we can find bands that are coming through the market and can work for us. Sure. So we, we kind of like that, and, and we feel it gives people a chance to save a little money up from the first weekend of the festival, and then if you don't want to come in the middle, you can go to the last weekend of the festival, right? So there's yeah. plenty of opportunities to come out and work. And we tried it last year in fall, but we knew that we were always going to come back to the summer because the summer is just summer fest. It's not fall yeah. fest, right? So, <laughs> of course, you know, of course. So cool. Well, that's great. I want to get a little bit more into the weeds for you know a lot of people listening to this show right now are in the industry. We're talking. We have uh, working artists, managers, agents, mm-hmm. labels, and just kind of break down how some of the deals work for the artists. And, and we're not we're not talking the amphitheater artists. I'm, I'm talking sure. kind of more of the mid level emerging artists in terms of you know guarantees versus uh, merch? Do you take cut of the merch sales? And just kind of like how all that works, how much of the deal can you kind of break down, sure. especially for those who are learning about what these kind of deals look like? Sure. First first of all, we are uh, we couldn't keep our prices at, at the prices that we are at if yep. it wasn't for sponsors, right? We've, yes. we've got a great sponsorship base from 
from Miller, from Generac, from Uline, the list goes on and on, that basically are paying a large chunk of the of the cost of the talent for the grounds entertainers, if you will. And right. and there are many headliners now on the secondary stages of the grounds that are six figures, six figures okay. and up now. So it's come to that. Sure. Um, during the daytime, I mean, of course it goes, you know, the, the, the how long the band's been around, how big mm-hmm. their name is in the market, how big their brand is in the market. And and but we we don't have, have anybody play for free. We're paying mm-hmm. every artist that comes in and plays. Great. And it can it can go from you know four hundred dollars up mm-hmm. across okay. the board. As far sure. as merch, if you're a baby band starting out, we do a, a fifty or seventy-five dollar merch number and you can sell your merch and keep the rest. Mm-hmm. If you're an established name that we feel is going to sell, then the number goes, you know, from 75, 25 to 80, 20. And then, Percent. and then we, yeah. And we keep the, we keep the small number, not the large number out of that. Right. right. And you know, there's, there's, there's food backstage, catering backstage, but that's usually for the big name national acts that are going to want something like that. We mm-hmm. try to keep water back there for everybody. And there's parking mm-hmm. on the grounds and, and way to get in for free. We get make, make our artists all get in for free. Mm -hmm. So we try to take artists as best we can, knowing full well that they can, A, they can do a full set. I mean, we never tell somebody to come in and do a half hour. They're welcome to come in and play for an an hour to 90 minutes if they they want, even a beginning band. We Mm -hmm. prefer them. We can put them in a three-hour block, and they can do two sets if they want. You know, it's uh, We're not like one of the other festivals that that cuts everybody off at 50 minutes or 45 minutes and you're off. So people should remember that when, when we're discussing with them the, the artists playing here, they mm-hmm. should let us know that they're willing to do a show like that. And we'd much rather have an artist that's willing to do a full show here rather than, than, than a half, you know, 40 minutes or 35 minutes. We had one artist once that came in and wanted to do 10 minutes. I said, no, why, why, why would you even want to do this <laughs> now, right? No, that's, right. You know, that, that's not for here. That's television. They do 10 right. minutes. Right. So, so, you know, <laughs> that's crazy. So that that's how it goes on the grounds. There's no percentage mm-hmm. deals. It's all flight. In the amphitheater, of course. of course, it's a different model because those are all percentage deals. And, and I'm sure you've explained and gone into how that works with, with your clientele here, too. So. so are you, I'm assuming the amphitheater is, are they versus deals? Are you talking as kind of a guarantee versus like, 90 percent of, sure. of tickets or what are we what are we talking here what what we do in the amphitheater if it's if it's a tour right yeah. then it's a guarantee versus percentage yeah. usually it's 85 15 sometimes okay. it becomes 90 10 sometimes because 95 5 if it's the right, right. and of course sure. the merch deals you know and and it's those are relatively large numbers but we try to keep them at 80 20 sure. at the at the worst side of it but they're all percentage deals where the band's getting a guarantee Right. And then we take all the expenses, take the expenses off the show gross after taxes. Mm-hmm. And then there's a split after that. And sometimes you get in the percentage and, and sometimes you don't. What makes us different from a lot of the venues and a lot of the hard ticket shows out there is we mm-hmm. keep the number of expenses that we're taking out of a show relatively low because we're keeping, of course, all our all our incidentals or our ancillaries rather. Yeah. Let's talk some of those expenses. What are some what are some standard expenses that get taken off for those shows? In a show? Well, yeah. you've got your production. If you're if you're supplying sound and lights, you've got your catering, you've mm-hmm. got your stage hands, you've got mm-hmm. your advertising. Those are the big ones. And then after that, a lot of times you'll have what's called a house nut. Or in that house nut, you're gonna have security and you're gonna have uh, ticket takers and ushers and everything mm-hmm. on, on like that. And then mm-hmm. we of course have fees that go on tickets. That, that that we have there and we have uh, a facility fee that we add in hmm. for Summerfest also. Okay. But then that comes out and then the expenses take, get backed out of the, of the guarantee, of course. And give me a ballpark number for kind of what that standard expense uh, would be I that would, comes off the top. I would say in our building, you're talking somewhere around 130K. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Right off the top. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. That's but I mean, that's a, to be expe- large you know, operation. That, that's true. Yeah, yeah, it is. An amphitheater is an expensive, expensive venue. I mean, when you think about sure. you can have a secu- you can have a stagehand bill of well, some shows will have a stagehand bill of a hundred thousand dollars. We've seen that already, wow. right? I mean, wow. you've got if you've got sure. somebody touring with twenty eight trucks or twenty six yeah. trucks, and you've got to put that all up, and then you've got to feed those people, and then you've got to <laughs> take it all down, and all sure. of that, and it it's a very expensive operation, but. You know, it's interest. It's an amazing animal to watch, especially amphitheater shows where they will show up. At, the trucks will usually roll in about seven o'clock, 
in the morning and yep. the riggers will get up there and put all their rigging points and get up and start the inn. And then you'll have it all set up somewhere around one mm. and then you'll have a sound check or a line check that happens at three o'clock in the afternoon. Some bands actually still go out and, and do their own sound checks, you know, mm. three o'clock. We open the gates at five, five thirty. Show starts at seven thirty. Show's done, and everybody's out of here by like one thirty in the morning. Mm -hmm. My guys get a couple hours sleep, and they do it all over again. Now, wow. back when it was eleven days straight, yeah, that was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> now that we've got a couple days in, uh, in the middle where they can get some rest, right, right. It's a lot more sane, and it's a lot better for them. You know, it's mm -hmm. a lot better for our people, our crews. It's a lot better for for the grounds. It's a lot better Definitely. the ground crew can clean up a little slower than they were in the past. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about the crew, specifically kind of the front of house engineers, the monitor engineers, the lighting technicians. For all the side stages specifically, you must have a, a, a hefty crew that's kind of helping run a lot of these stages. Where do they all come from? How do you find the right people? And, and how does that all work? Sure. We get our sound and our lights from one company that's Clearwing Audio, which is okay. a company out. Well, they started in Milwaukee. Now they're Milwaukee. They're the... They're Phoenix, they're, I think, Denver, they're in a few markets, and we do a deal with them where we rent all our sound and our lights for the grounds, the non-amphitheater shows from them, plus a light and sound package for the amphitheater if we're going to need it, right? Gotcha. Most of the time, the bands in the amphitheater bring their own, their own production, so we change it out. We don't just use our sound and lights, we're changing it out every single day for wow. that in and the out that we were talking about earlier. The grounds, as far as our crew... We're all IATSE union guys okay. here for stagehands. Mm -hmm. And we've got light guys and monitor guys and front of house guys that come from the union. And of course, mm -hmm. the clearing guys are there. But if it's a band that's some, somewhat reputable and it's been around for a while and they've got their own sound man, by all means, mix the sound. But we'll probably have one of our guys sitting right next to you in case you have any issues with it. Because, sure. you know, some some baby bands may not have the, the caliber of the guy that, that's used to being outside in that venue of that size because totally when you're sitting out in a in a fourteen thousand seat outdoor venue and you have and you're 150 you know feet out on the board sometimes it's right. a little crazy right but yeah but our you know we've been using union guys for a long time and, and some people say well you know the union can be so expensive sometimes but i'm telling you when you have a call and it's 150 people that you need and you know they're all going to be there that's yeah. a good thing it's a Definitely. it's a bad thing when you have a show and there's supposed to be 50 guys for the inn or 35 guys for the inn and only 10 show up. That's yeah. a problem. So right. <laughs> <laughs> so you like to have people that you know are going to get there and the union guys have been really good with us so far. That's great. And in terms of the staging, who's setting up all of the stages and the scaffolding and all of that every year? Well, once again, all our stages are, are permanent now. They're permanent. Okay. Everything's permanent on wow. the ground. So you've got... Cool. Beautiful venues, beautiful dress rooms. It's all it's all permanent. Uh, the ground sound and lights is already up when, when the artists get here. So they're not setting that up. As far as band gear goes, helping off the trucks, those are the union crew guys that are there all day. Gotcha. We have we have a, a stock union crew of uh, four guys that are there every okay. single day for every single stage. So, cool, cool. And they're doing the work. And we got and two stage managers at each stage. It's a pretty well-run operation. We have yeah. uh, one gentleman that does all the advance for all the national acts on the grounds. Wow. So he's also doing the amphitheater <laughs> production, yeah. right? He's pretty good at what he does. And and then <laughs> but he's doing all the advance on the grounds and, and people have to understand, and they do in a, in a festival environment like ours, that sometimes you can't do what you'd like to do and no, and you have to be told, no, you can't bring this, you can't do that. We mm. have a, we have a semi full of band gear here all the time. Uh. So, I mean, every stage has a drum kit, Okay. We have more Fender and Marshall amps and you can shake a stick at that. A bunch <laughs> that we own and a bunch that we rent out for the season. So there's gear for everybody here if they decide they don't want to bring their own. Oh, that's and, great. Uh, you know, some acts, will, they'll be happy just bring their guitars can sure. bring their own keyboards perhaps. But, you know, if it's the stock amps, we probably have them here. And it's yep. DW drums, so it's always good gear, so... Great. Uh, that's nice that, I mean, Backline makes it helpful when you have so many acts and so many, so many changeovers. What, and, and, also, and also, real quick, on that, on that note, when you yeah. have four guys on the grounds that no band gear. Yes. So when you, even when you brought your own stuff and it breaks down, mm. now you're, you're supposed to go on in 15 minutes. 
There's a truck <laughs> that's got what you need nearby, or that guy's back there showing you how to fix it, which is great. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming you've run into those instances where uh, you have a band setting up and it's kind of that emergency moment where you need to uh, trade out some equipment pre- pretty quick. Right. Right. Yeah. And it might be it might be a band in the afternoon or it might be your headliner. Right. And you've mm. got to take care of everybody because the last thing you want is that train to stop rolling. You know, right. and all of a right. sudden you have an extra half hour and a changeover and now all your scheduling is out of whack. So, yeah, and we're and we're cognizant about situations here for like when we're closing up at night to try to stagger the closing times for the bands. So mm-hmm. not everybody has to go out there at once and have big traffic jams You're going to have some traffic jams, but sure. you're trying to stagger all the different stages that either started at different times or get off in different times at the end of the evening. So mm-hmm. anything that keeps that from going off the rails is, is a good thing. What are we talking in terms of change over times for those side stages typically? For for the daytime acts, yeah. half hour. Okay. We try to do a half hour changeover and then we, we do 45 minutes to an hour for the headliner and whatever we advance with them. Okay. Just because I think there's that energy level that changes around. It's not just the changeover so much. Sure. the headliner it's creating the energy for your audience out front so yeah the anticipation but, uh, is huge we're, we've gotten pretty pretty good at doing half hour changeovers great and so it's this uh, line check uh, for all the artists that are kind of you know coming into festivals fresh it's it's just your standard line check during those changeovers well the, yeah and the national act has to be done done with his sound check or line check or whatever by noon because the first band oh, okay. goes on at noon actually we tell them 11 30. Oh, so okay. they they oh, have wow. to come in they have to come in and do their setup, and and mark where they're going to be on the stage at like eight o'clock in the morning because wow. by eleven thirty they're out and the first act that's playing at noon is setting up because we have to get them on stage. Oh, that's interesting because of those those ten or so side stages that have those headliners that you're mentioning. Some of them are the six figure headliners. They are they hauling in all of their touring uh, stage gear and setting, decking out the stage like they would normally do for any of their other tour stops? They would like to. And sometimes <laughs> if it's down to maybe one semi, we, we will let them. It, it all depends okay. how fast they say they can, can do the changeover. But once again, you know, if you're, if you're putting a, a large name as a headliner on one of the larger stages on the grounds, you yeah. want the show to be spectacular. You want the crowd yes. to have a great time. So if that means you have to put up their set or a large portion of their set, once again, my production person in the amphitheater who does all the grounds knows the artists and, and knows what he, what, he, what he feels can make that show work and make it look really good. And then he and the tour manager or the production manager for the band will work mm-hmm. that out and say, we'll leave some things on the truck. Do you have this? Do you have that? You know, you might need a higher riser. You got, of course, you're going to have a drop because everybody's going to have a drop on the back, and mm-hmm. and and the rest is, you know, just to get it up there, and make it look good. Right. And in terms of, I mean, they're done sound checking at 11:30 a.m. and then you have, gosh, how many acts? How many bands? Five, throughout six, the day? five, six five before they take the stage, stage again. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, do you run into any issues where? Wires are getting crossed or things are getting moved or, you know, stuff is coming down or putting up or the headliner gets back there and is like, wait a minute, wh- where did everything go? <laughs> no, 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 actually not too bad. I think our crews have been the same crew guys on most of these stages for the last four or five years. The bands yeah. that are out doing it, they yep. they know the situation because they're doing festivals. So they know sure. how, how that how that game is going to work. But they're happy because they can come in here and use their own. They can use their own setup on a lot of times sure. as a headliner where you're going to go to play one of the festivals out there and they're going to say no. Yeah. And they're going to say you only do 45 minutes once again. So so right. we give right. the headliner spotlights at night. Mm. We, we create a good environment for them. They have nice cool. dressing rooms. We don't throw them out. It's, it's a good thing. Yeah, nice. I'm curious about the the video, kind of the, the stages. Uh, do all of your stages have, have screens? Yes, all our, all of our stages now have have video. We have mm. we have iMag on some of the stages that we that we can do What's for, for the drop if they're bringing if they're bringing their own stuff if they're bringing their own video. But okay. we have video screens and cameras showing it to the audience, of course, sure. showing the band live to the audience. And we also can crew? supply some things. And then we also, if we're doing if we're doing EDM bands, yeah, you know, we augment everything we have. So, mm. got a lot of video screens for for EDM stuff. 
And is it your uh, video operators, or do are the acts expected to bring in their own? We use our own video operators at night. Okay. I and mean, it's cool. It's the same guys. It's a company called Mindpool. Okay. We've been been around for a long time, and they have crew guys on every stage doing it. Cool. And we feel that that's the that's the best way to go. You can, sure. If you're putting up the gear, you want the guys that know the gear. We're we're a part of setting up the gear, and then yep. we'll let them do it and let them run it. Nice, nice. In terms of hospitality and just how all those operations work, food and beverage, F and B, how does how how does that work for Summerfest? Kind of step me through behind the scenes how all that works for both the the acts themselves, sure. but also the crew on the ground. Right. We are not one of the events that has a specific central crew spot for feeding. Okay. We provide food for all the stages for all the national crews. So mm. so they they get all the deli trays, all the fruit trays, and everything is delivered for sandwiches are all delivered fresh every morning to the stage manager who puts it in a spot for the national acts that are playing. The local acts we do not feed them. Okay. We just make sure that there's enough water and sodas and things for sure. them. Um, and that operation is pretty much a well-oiled machine where we, we've mm. got it laid out. The amphitheater, of course, is kind of a different model in that right. you know, they have full catering, sometimes even tour catering that we sure. pay for for them. But for the ground stages, by and large, we we understand that they're there for the day. They're, the band may not be there because they don't have to be. Right. They don't have to be there until the evening for the show. So we want to take care of the band's crew. And then we do our best to make sure they're comfortable. Yeah, right. That's interesting because I know some festivals they have kind of your the artist village or so that right. is that central spot. But because the stages are there's so many stages and they're so far apart, you're saying and that it's there's, just there's so many stages so far apart, and yeah. we and we we populate it all with customers. I mean, the, the small mm-hmm. backstage areas, and and we can't we can't find a one spot on the grounds where we could have like a village for. Right, the bands and, and and the crew. So right, we've we've never really done that. It's it's mm-hmm. one of those things that makes sense. Yeah. In terms of some of these the the smaller uh, ground stages, the the tiki hut, the ones that are on the riverfront, these these little these little you know pop up stages or so. Right. How do those operate? Who runs those? Who books those? Who are the artists that are performing that? How, how does that all work? Well, a lot of that goes through a gentleman here named Vic Thomas. Okay. who keeps track of those little stages and what they're doing here on the grounds. There's a couple of people that book a few of those stages for us, sure. the, little, the little pop-up things, and they're really popular. I mean, yeah. people love them walking around and seeing it. Even even just even just the busker guys that are out working yeah. on the grounds, they like seeing that. And uh, we try to make that an exciting exciting moment for the bands. And, and, and when you get right down to it, it's probably no more than – 25 people can fit in front of a stage or 30 people can fit in front of those stages. Right. Yeah. But that's what makes it the charm. Right. Right. That's what, that's what makes it so much fun. You, you've got a couple of people that might know somebody they're going to hop up on stage and play along and have a little fun going into it. That's the magic of, that's the magic of doing a festival like ours. Right. Once again, just having a little something for everybody all the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, remember that uh, the Tiki Hut? I, I played that a couple years uh, over by the riverfront, and and that that's actually you know has a, a significant, a, a bigger location in front of the stage. Yeah. Probably fit maybe 150, 200 or something people. Very crowded, in. 150. Very, very, crowded. Very, very yeah. crowded. But you know, I, I would pride myself and pack it in. Man, it's just you know people are there to discover music, and that was what's so exciting. Is just like they're there to discover music. They buy so much merch. They're tipping. Yep. Uh, they're there. They're, just, like, what really they are supporting. is. They're they're ready for a party, yes. you know, and that is, and that, that's what makes it different from a lot of other venues and a lot of the other, of the situations where they come here, it's inexpensive and yes. we want to have a party, you know, Yes. and yes. it's added value. And we see, but see somebody who blows up to be a superstar a year or two later. And, and we yep. can say, we saw them on the yep. Tiki hut. <laughs> totally. <Right? Yeah. laughs> Absolutely. So when it comes to the artists who are listening to this, you know, even let's talk about the local ones around Wisconsin or the Midwest. And they're like, man, you know, Summerfest is the dream festival for me. I would just love to play Summerfest. What is your recommendation for them to how to go about getting a spot at Summerfest? Well, you know, people always say, well, you get bands from these local agents or agents mm-hmm. from other cities. And that's not true. We get a couple of bands from those guys, but by and large, if you're out playing in the clubs mm. and the word is out that you're good, 
either someone's going to come and tell one of us here, or you're going to oh. send something to us, some kind of press kit. Mm -hmm. And we like to look at all that kind of stuff. So please send it all out. We're all here. And we love listening. We love finding new stuff. And and persistence is great. You know, sometimes people go, ah, I don't want to bother them. And I, stop. Don't even worry about that. Bother us. Bother the crap out of us. <laughs> and eventually someone's going to pick up on it, you know? I mean, look at it this way. For us, from the buyer side, mm -hmm. you don't think we badger these major artists for for acts all the time? I mean, Those we call ways. them till they get sick of hearing from us, right? <laughs> sure. And then finally, they may turn around and say, just sell them a damn band. We're sick of listening right. to them, you know? <laughs> and and that's, that's kind of how we all started in the business, right? Yeah. I mean, when Summerfest, when I started here 46 years ago, you know, the agents out there, the agents that I'm dealing with now, the, the bigger ones in those companies, they were like me. They were just coming out of the mailroom, right? right they were just, right, sure. they were just starting out. Yep. And I would badger, I would badger their bosses, and their bosses would say, say to the to their assistants, "You sell them a band. I don't want to listen to them anymore." <laughs> and then, and we build relationships with those guys, right? Sure. So we still know those people. So it, it's we have no problem if there's passion, mm. right? Yeah. If the if it's if somebody's going to badger us and then say, oh, the money's not right, don't do that. But if right. if you want to come to us and you have a passion for playing, yes, you'll get in. It might it may take a little bit, but you'll get in. I love that. That's that's incredible advice, and and I hope everybody listening is taking that to heart. You're probably going to be eating your words as you're getting a slew of people that are just <laughs> nonstop. 2023, 2023. Right. There you go. That's exactly. Oh, yeah. But I mean, it, it makes perfect sense, and that that's the thing. I mean, the key to this industry is polite persistence. I mean, that's how you get in the door anywhere, top to bottom, left to right, anywhere in this industry is just by being persistent, but also being polite about it, friendly about it. I mean, Absolutely. Not, you're obnoxious but, yeah. about it just once. Everybody's going to know it. You yes. know, the next person Absolutely. down the line is going to call and see what about this band. It's going to be, nah, uh, uh, don't <laughs> exactly. do it. Yeah. Word so, spreads very so, quickly. Yeah. So just, mm -hmm. just do, a, do a good job. Understand the situation you're in as a new artist. Yes. Understand you might not be happy with the way things are going backstage and you might be being ignored by somebody, but eventually sure. they'll get it together with you and, and get mm -hmm. your show on and make it work. And mm -hmm. if it was great, or my, all, all my stage managers on the grounds give report cards for every act that plays it. Wow. At the end of the festival, there's a report card and the, the standard line to them is, I don't care whether whether they, I, I don't care how the draw was. I mean, I want to know how the draw was because that's important to us. But how did they treat everybody? How were mm -hmm. they backstage? If it was a stage sponsored by Miller, did you hold up a Budweiser that you brought along? Don't do that. <laughs> don't ever do that because sponsors right. are our lifeblood, right? So Yes, yes. <laughs> but, you know, you just, you, you come in knowing that you're going to work your way to the top. And if you do a good job and you're professional and your crew is professional, it's great. We love you. And we'll see that on a report card from our stage managers at the end. I love that. I love that. That's such great advice. Well, Bob, this has been so much fun. And I, I have one final question that I ask everybody who comes on the, the show. Shoot. And it's, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? Making it in a new mu music business is making it in the music business, right? Uh -huh. Right. What, what's, what's the difference? It's the passion, right? It's the quality, and it's the ability to interact with both the people that are putting the show on and your mm -hmm. audience. Mm -hmm. And that's, those are the moments. We, we always talk about it here. We say the, the biggest moment for anybody that works at Summerfest, forget the booking guys, everybody that works at Summerfest, mm -hmm. it's when you're sitting there and there's a bunch of people there in the audience and the lights go down and the lights come up and that bass hits you right in the chest. That's what it's all about. <laughs> that yeah. is what it's all about. It's creating the magic of live music. Mm, love it. Bob Babish, thank you so much. It's been great. Thank you. You take good care. We'll see you this summer, right? All right. We'll see you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> take care. Today's episode was edited by Maxton Hunter, theme music by Brassroots District, and produced by all the great people at Ari's Take.